Welcome. Thanks for having me. Good to yes. have you here. Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, since we first started building insulated solar electric cookers, ISEX, um, you know, I've had laboratory students working on it. I've had students in um, service learning project-oriented classes working on them, and largely just seeing if people can build them. And I've had... Uh, groups of mechanical engineering students on their capstone senior project that they have to do. It's kind of like you're the client, sure. right? And they spend a year working on a project for you. And so I've done this for, you know, like, I guess now it's been seven years, you know, like we just keep building different sure. ISECs. And, um, you know, invariably they end up here quite a bit yes. because I have the solar panels up on the roof. And while the students... It's easy for them to get in the lab and build stuff. Very few of them have the capacity to sit and cook with them every day. Right. And so, you know, I, I cook I cook ev pretty much every day, at least once, on the, um, the ISEC. And so, you know, I get a lot of firsthand experience. Uh, oh, this works, this doesn't work, this is what we need to change. And this is, this is about to go back to the lab. Um, this is this is really an excellent design, in my opinion. Uh, the only thing that needs to be changed is I need to raise the maximum temperature so I can get it hotter. We have we have a thermal switch in there that turns off at 180 Celsius, sure. which is like 320 Fahrenheit or something like so, that. Yeah. yeah, so we'd like we'd like it to go up to 300 Celsius, which is 570 oh, yeah. Fahrenheit, and so we we can store a lot more heat. And so. Um, the thermal storage mechanism in here is it's just a solid aluminum puck. We've got this chunk of aluminum, and then we have a little disc, a uh, thin di aluminum disc with a heating element in it, and the wires come out to the outside world, right? And these are all finely machined, so you get a really good thermal contact between the surfaces. We found that, that that's a huge issue, right? And then we have an aluminum pot with also a very smooth bottom on it. Mm -hmm. And the reason this is cool is you can um, you can engage the heater directly to the cooker, to the cook pot. You can engage the heater just to the thermal storage, right? Or then you can use both. And so right now, um, it's it's in this mode where the heater is heating up the puck. And... Um, the heater right now is at 186, and it'll probably go up to 200, maybe a little bit more before the thermal switch turns it off. Mm -hmm. um, the puck is probably 20 degrees below that, because right now we're heating the puck. Sure. Right? So, um, so I don't know. Let's cook something. Okay. So if you look down, you see the aluminum pot. You see I got a thermal couple just hanging in here. Right, and I'll just dump some olive oil on there because I always feel no matter what what you like to eat, you'll like it more if you fry it in olive oil. Yeah, and so get that in this. You can hear how hot it is, right? We got four people, so we'll cook four chunks of chicken here. Just uh, drumsticks. Yeah, just drumsticks. Yeah, right. And then there's a number of things I can do now, but I think I'll put a top over this. I'll just put that here and let it sit and then put the... Okay. I don't know how... And then you might take a look here, right? This is the chicken. It's now 11, 12 Celsius, right? So it's just not even room temperature yet. But... Um, the heater puck is still 184, so that's still quite warm. And it, it'll get a little cooler because the heat is coming off to the food, mm -hmm. but it's also still getting 100 watts from the sun, right? Sure. So if this was evening, I actually, I actually did the same thing in the evening yesterday, and it, it you know, dropped quicker because we weren't getting any power. Yeah. 
but I was able to cook. Yeah, you know, I was able to cook a bunch of stuff. Sure. You know, as the sun was going down last yeah. night. How long does it, quote unquote, hold the charge for cooking after it's heated up? So um, it. I guess we we we'd have to look at the cooling rate, and of course, it's it's a function of how much um, how much food or how much metal you have that's hot, and how thick the insulation is. Mm-hmm. Right. I know that. Um, a student that was working with a very similar model said the thermal half-life was, I believe, nine hours. Wow. So after nine hours, the difference in temperature between the hot puck and the outside world um, was cut in half. Yeah. And so now, I mean, already, let's take a look. Um, yeah, so the puck or the the heater uh, slab is at 173, and the chicken that we have it at uh, is at just it's still 20. It's still you know room temperature. But again, we you know the you you saw where I put the thermal couple. The chicken is kind yes. of it's it, it's in the middle. The heat pipe is is something that's used to greatly enhance thermal conductivity between t- two things. Like so, you, you might use a heat pipe to keep your uh, your computer chip cool, okay. right? And what you do is you have one fluid and evacuate everything else. Okay. And so if you have a point that's hot and a point that's cold, what happens is the point where it's hot has a higher vapor pressure. And so it evaporates or boils the liquid and that increases the vapor pressure, okay. right? But at the colder point, it condenses. Right? And so that, that gives off a lot of heat. And so it's a way to transfer heat really, really fast. And so what ultimately happens here is we get a heat pipe kind of mechanism in that the chicken will produce some liquid. Uh-huh. Right, It will go to the bottom and boil. It will displace all of the air in there. So you just have like a water vapor environment. And that water vapor at atmospheric pressure will condense everywhere. And so you wind up, you know, almost boiling the surface of the chicken with the condensate from the boiling water oh, wow. on the bottom. Sure. Right. And so what you'll see is, is it's not, that boiling water has not yet reached the point where the thermocouple is. But we'll watch it, you know, it took quite a while to get to 20 Right, maybe it'll go to thirty in a little bit, and then zoop, it'll get really close to hundred wow. right away. Sure. Do you want to go to the roof, or do you want to? Um, yeah, you you could you could take yeah. one up to the roof, and I'll cut some onions. We'll throw some onions in in a bit. Okay. So those big solar panels are, are grid tied. That's the, the, just the grid tied solar. Mm-hmm. These three, these three panels are each a hundred watts, and they're probably set at about the right angle for this time of year because they're pretty. You know, they, they, they really should be a little flatter, but this is good. Because sure. um, we're, we're at summer solstice right now. Um, for me to put up solar panels and do my work at Poly would have required thousands of dollars in contracting with the, the, the university right. electricians. <laughs> and probably they were saying, you know, on the order of several months. And I was like, oh, okay, thanks. Right. And, and we, we, we had these up at the end of that day, yes. right? I yeah. just brought my students over. I said, come on, we're going to slap sure. these up, right? And and we wound up doing the hot diodes paper. We had the experiments right here. And so now after we finished that paper, I just uh, ran the wires down into the kitchen so mm-hmm. I could start cooking. And it's really made a huge difference. Like, so when you talk about the failure of solar cooking, right? I, I In my appropriate technology classes, I, I um, describe solar cooking as probably the most well-established development failure because solar cookers work so well and yet they're not adopted. And they're not adopted because people don't want to cook outside, they don't want to cook in the middle of the day, they don't want to have to move things around, they don't want to cook at 100 Celsius, right? They want it to be hotter. And so, um, and I've had people, you know, laughing. I had friends laugh in my face when I told them I was interested in solar cooking. And... um, so now, one of the things I sometimes say is, uh, I'm developing a solar cooking technology that will fail for a different reason, <laughs> okay. right? You know, so, so now, you know, we've got the thing figured out where, okay, we can solar cook and we'll stay inside. Um, we can get hotter if we store the energy. 
Um, you could you could cook at night, right? It's still better to cook in the daytime if you can. And so, you know, so that's where we are right now. Um, I got a hundred thousand dollars from UK Aid through a um, an organization called Max Modern Energy Cooking Systems, mm -hmm. and um, or Modern Energy Cooking Services, I think, and. With that hundred thousand dollars, a good a good half of it, I gave to anyone who was interested in joining me in building solar cookers and could convince me that they had the capacity to do it. So, there's on the order of seven seven to ten collaborators, mostly in Africa, mm -hmm. that I shared that money with, and and they're they're building these. We meet. Thursdays at 10 o'clock in the morning. You might want to join actually for this video. Cool. Sure. You know, you yeah. should you should join next Thursday. It's California time, 10 yeah. o'clock in the morning. I'm trying to think of where I'll be next Thursday. Yeah, if not the two Thursday. Weeks. The if Thursday it's... after that, it's fine. Yeah. It's every Thursday. Yeah. And we talk about the difficulties we have. Um, a, a lot of the transition, like a lot of the things that have transpired. You know, I was telling you about solar panels on the roof, and then I just went off in this direction. Oh, that's, that's good. Um, let, let me let me just tell you, we've got we've got three solar panels in parallel, right? Um, three one hundred watt solar panels, but they don't give me three hundred watts because I have them hooked to an ISEC that is set up for one hundred watt solar panel. Mm -hmm. So I get a hundred watts for it, but because there's three in parallel, I get a hundred watts when the sun is at a pretty high angle, and even if there's a little bit of cloud. Right. So that's that's what we got here. Sure. So about the learning community, um, I mean, we used we used all the money up. Um, like the end of March, the grant finished up, and I really expected um, I really expected to lose the community. Right. I mean, when you're out of money, you're out of friends. Right. <laughs> uh, but but. Um, it's actually the activities increase, yeah. and part part of it is because it's working. Like they're starting to produce these and sell them, and people are pretty excited about uh, the opportunities that 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 we can look forward to. Producing and selling ISEX. ISEX, okay. Yeah, and um, and the collaborators are actually bringing in new collaborators. So there's people that I had never given money to. That are coming to these meetings and saying, "Yeah, man, like we want, we want in. Like, can you help us learn how to build these things?" And uh, and our, um, you know, they said, "So what do we, what do we need to do?" And I said, "Well, look, the, the guy who introduced you to us, Salma from Togo, right? He's doing it. Like, don't talk to me, right? Talk to him. He's your friend. He knows. He knows everything. Yeah. And there's another collaborator, um, Robert Van Buskirk." Who works in Malawi, and, and his his main focus is bringing in inexpensive solar electricity to electrify rural electrification, and so um, what he's doing is uh, he's found a way to subsidize and import shipping containers of solar panels at very low cost, and so 100 watt panels he's selling now in Malawi for 25 dollars, and he wants that to extend to other countries. So Salma and Togo got together with him and said, yeah, like I, I can sell these panels and I'm gonna sell them with cookers. And so he just received his first like proof of concept shipment of 100 panels that are all 200 watts each. So he's, I mean, like he's really excited about that. And so while well, the grant is over and the project is finished, it's just getting started. Sure, sure. Well, and uh, I mean, there's a point where proof of concept is, it's proven. Concept mm -hmm. was five years ago, 10 years ago. When did you start doing this with your students? Yeah, and, right. Yeah, and and it's probably been proven time and again after year two or three, right? I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, it, but it just keeps, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. so so the proof, but the thing is, is that's the whole point. That's the yeah. whole failure of, of solar cooking is, is, you know, the proof of concept that it works, but how well does it work? What is the inconvenience? You know, how, uh, like... How sexy is it, right? All right, of that right. stuff. Like one of the things they said to me, um, Bajanga from Cameroon, you know, almost everyone has said this at one point, um, said, uh, that is so ugly, nobody will buy it, <laughs> right? Yeah. You, you have to make that look better. And I said, dude, to me, that is already beautiful. 
And they laughed at me and I said, but the whole point is, I'm the wrong person to make this pretty. You do it. Yes. You have the people who want, you know, who you want it to appeal to. I'll teach you how to make it so it works. And so they were all like, oh yeah, man, like we'll do that. <laughs> so let's go back down. Sure. Remember I said mm -hmm. we jump? Sure. Right, the temperature is 97 now. Well, okay, right, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. On, on the chicken. From what was it, 20 or something? You know, yeah. It was, yeah. So, it, you know, it, it's made that jump as as the, um, the heat pipe action became prevalent. So one of the other things about ISEC is, you know, you know, by and large, it's relatively low power. Like, you can make it high power for a short period of time. Um, but so... When you go to grill or fry something, you often boil because the condensate from the water, like so, you know, if you throw in vegetables, for instance, right, they're going to need some water. And on a 1500 watt uh, skillet, you evaporate that water immediately, and then, and then you're then you're burning stuff very nicely, right? Which is, you know, you're, you're caramelizing your your meat and your, your uh, and so managing water is a major portion of of ISEC. And so one of the things that I do, and I'll do that right now, is I'll pour the, like there's probably some moisture from this in the bottom of the pan from the chicken. And I'll dump that out um, so that the onions, and then maybe I'll do it for the onions too. Sure. And I've always been interested in, in energy systems and so, solar energy to begin with. Uh, and this seemed like the, this is the route that made the most sense. And Pete's work just fed right into that. Is it, uh, is it uh, like a hot plate uh, thermal or is it an induction cooker? What are you sending it the electricity to? The best example, the closest I could think of it is, is like it's similar to a hot plate. They are these little rectangles, about yay big, uh, and we attach them to the bottom of a pot. Mm -hmm. And then we plug it in and it does its job amazing. Sure, so and you insulate around that to help retain the heat and build yeah. it up? Yes, we, uh, we insulate the, uh, the pot to reduce the amount of energy that is being lost so we could keep it, keep the energy so it's only heating up the material we wanted to. Yeah, okay. The last quarter we had a group create that um, solid thermal storage that mm -hmm. Pete was showing earlier, as well as one that was testing xylitol. Um, it's a sugar alcohol, like erythritol. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, to be a phase change material to replace uh, erythritol because erythritol thermally degrades over time yeah. but xylitol wasn't supposed to it doesn't have hi as high of a heat before it melts as uh, erythritol does I believe it's something like uh, 90 degrees Celsius versus 120 um, and last summer when I was part of the frost program uh, we were, I focused mainly on a uh, direct, like I'm working on now, but I built a little pancake here that uh, used nichrome wire, very similar to what we have in our uh, ovens that doesn't have the sheathing around it. Uh, because a lot of people said they were not happy with having wires coming from the pot. To make just to, so people you'll meet their comfort zone. Yes, it's probably a little less efficient, right? Because you gotta the transfer has got to be. It, yes. Yeah. Um, well, the pancakes pancake heaters worked fairly well. The problem was we couldn't find a pot that uh, worked with it because we wanted it the same size as the pucks we were making. Uh, we ended up using a uh, stainless steel pot, which doesn't conduct thermal energy as well. Uh, so that added the amount of time it would take to bring water to a boil. Sure. But uh, it wasn't totally out of place in comparison to other direct uh, cookers we were using. Okay. Um, have you looked at other uh, outfits that are trying to do something similar or in a, kind of the same track, like sun buckets where it's the, the solar thermal direct to the phase change, or Ecoca or Sunspot PV where they're doing it direct to induction cookers? Um, we have looked at the solar uh, buckets, but one of the pro one of the drawbacks of that is you need a high amount of power. Yeah. The phase change material for the sun buckets is potassium sodium nitrates. Mm -hmm. um, it's a non-eutectic material, and it melt it has a melting range between 220 degrees and 270 degrees. 
So when I say non-eutectic, it's I'm saying that it doesn't melt at a specific temperature. Yeah. Uh, it melts over a range. And the temperature we need is very hard to do with one solar panel. Right. Which has been a large focus up uh, for what we've been doing our quick response. Sure. Great. Anything else you'd want to say about your I, working on this? Uh, I can't think of much right now. I believe I explained um, sure. most of it as yeah. well as I could. Yeah. No. Oh, great. Thank you. With a lot of water, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna drain that, and we'll cook it for just a little bit more, and see if we can caramelize the onions oh, sure. a little bit. Yeah. And I left the top off so that if there's any more residual, um, you know, moisture, it'll it'll evaporate. Sure. And so we'll probably get a little bit of, um, you know, caramelization with the onions. Maybe. Mm -hmm. You know who Matt Alonzo is? Yes. Right? Yeah. So his PhD thesis, he, he gives you all kinds of data on those. And actually, the performance of the aluminum is higher than the, the performance of the oh, salt. Really? Yeah, okay. as far as as far as cooking power, sure. The salts hold more. The salt. This the salt pucks hold more energy, mm -hmm. right? So you could, you know, boil more water. Right. You know, I don't know what thirty percent more water, right? Um, I mean, you, you read the thesis, right? But. Um, but you're going to get that power much faster because aluminum is such a good conductor of heat, okay. right? And so, um, but if you, um, I mean, if you read my thermal storage paper, it has a reference to his PhD okay, thesis, sure. right? You know, it, it'd yeah. be worth reading. Um, you know, it's enormous, but you could just go through it and read Point and look and look at the diagrams, yeah. right? Yeah. I actually spent like an hour and a half up with my Alonzo on the phone yesterday, uh, Friday. And one of the things is if you heat it and cool it too much, the you know with the salt when it goes through this transition uh, expands, and so you're going to wind up blowing this up a little bit. Yeah. And um, you just don't have that with a solid piece of aluminum, right? There's just I mean, it can't you know it can't go bad. I mean, what right. can go wrong? Yeah, it's, it's all solid. Yeah, yeah. It's just like mine. It's a yeah. solid block. And it's not like expanding and contracting like the salts do. It well, I mean, does. It, it does expand, it does, and contract, but but it, it all does that. You know, it's it's all aluminum, right. so it all does it the same. Right, right, right. As opposed to, as opposed to the the um, the salts when they go through their phase change, they expand more than the aluminum does, so they yeah. start to push out on it. Yeah. So they probably have to come up with all sorts of ways to or let it relax or yeah. inside. Or, and then I'm thinking, the bucket you turn it upside down to put it into the focal point, and then you flip it back over. Well, with the salts, you're sloshing around, right? And whereas the aluminum is can be pretty much fixed sure. in place. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And so I mean. They have challenges with respect to if they crack through, you know, that that kind of thermal cycling, um, and the quality control has to be really good because you have people carrying these things, right? And so, if I were to compare what we're doing, and on some right, I, at some level, I have no right to compare because they've done it, yeah. and we're just giving it a try, right? Um, but what we're aiming for is a much lower quality of control, control quality, right? We're aiming for a much lower level of, uh, of quality because ours are not going to have to move, right? And so they don't have to be as strong because uh, they, they won't be dropped, right? Um, if they leak, it would leak out little by little into a place that's you know protected. Sure. Um, there's a possibility that they don't even need to be sealed, in which case the pressure issue is a non-issue. Right. And even if they are sealed, we could have an air chamber in there that would absorb that distance, yeah. that difference, because, um, and they tend not to do that because if there's air in there, it'll go to the top and insulate the top right. from, so I mean I'm not sure and I can't speak for them, but um, but we anticipate that ours will be much less expensive 
because conceivably we could get away with this very high temperature glue that we bought that goes up past 300 Celsius, wow. um, where everything they do is aluminum welded. And that's, you know, that's a, um, it's a, like, I mean, you heard Kevin say that welding aluminum is, is a challenge. The performance is better with the aluminum and it's just so idiot proof yeah. and bulletproof and safe. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just gonna put a little bit of um, of uh, rice in sure. this now to absorb the uh, condensate that you saw that I dumped it back in, right? Yes, yes. I dumped the condensate, or the well, it's perfect because it's it's the juice, right? Let's call it the chef's term, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the um, the community that's come up around this, you know, for instance. You know, like I said, with Robert Van Buskirk in Malawi, and we're, we're importing solar panels, and we have a lot of people. Oh, and and what we realized, or what you know, what he taught me, is that the the, the biggest draw uh, for rural electrification is um, solar water pumping for irrigation, right? So those systems, those thousand dollar systems, will pay for themselves in one growing season of like three months. Yeah, and so. That's the other thing he's importing in mass, and um, one of our co uh, one of our collaborators, the only American collaborator is this, uh, is uh, Alexis Ziegler, who lives in a small eco village in Virginia. Okay. And what was interesting is he called me up very early on, as soon as he, like he introduced himself. I did not look for any of these people, right? Like, like because sure. I have these videos out and stuff, I'd get. I get an email from India, from um, you know, from Togo, from uh, Cameroon, and and from Virginia. And he immediately called me and said, "I think this ISEC is great, but you're making them all wrong." And I was like, "I like this." Yes, right. I like Tell this, me more. Right? So um, yeah, and so he works uh, with uh, an eco village in Jamaica that my daughter and I visited over Thanksgiving as cool. as kind of a, a working vacation. It was really great. Sure. And. Um, and he works with uh, the Hopi Nation, the Navajo Nation, and more recently with uh, Puerto Rico. So when you look at the situation, so, so his gig is direct DC solar. Right? So he just uses sure. the electricity, like our direct cook, directly mm -hmm. from the solar panel. You use it because batteries, well, AC, switching to AC and battery storage, all that is very expensive and very unnecessary. Right, it was it was necessary for a grid up until recently, right? But uh, but now there's no need for it except that that's what everybody's doing. And so, on their community in Virginia, they are off grid, direct DC solar, and they have a very small battery capacity. And their their you know, mo is uh, when the sun goes down, we, we we don't work, right? Like we have enough battery capacity for our computers and lights. But our power tools, everything runs on DC, direct solar. Or if there's, you know, if there's no sun, then you just dial down the amount of work that you're going to do that day. And consequently, it's really inexpensive to the point that they say everybody could live this way. So they're the proof of concept, and they're spinning it off. This community in Jamaica essentially lives the same way. And, um, and he contacted a group of activists from Puerto Rico and he's having two workshops in Virginia, uh, mid-July and early August. And I'm going to the one in July for two weeks. And so I'll be, you know, I'll be uh, a participant and student oh, cool. as well as an sure. instructor sure. in in this um, in this workshop. And so I'm I'm pretty excited. And so that'll be kind of my last big foray into gathering my information before I take off for Africa in. Or in September. Sure. And what are you doing there? Doing more of the same? Oh, right? so I'm, I'm on sabbatical for a year. Yeah, yeah. And I'm visiting all these different collaborators. Oh, okay. Right. Right. okay. So, right. so on some level, I am yeah. doing exactly the same, right? Because right. I'm going to go and learn yeah. and teach and try to promote. Sure. But, my, I mean, my interests are, are you know, uh, primarily ISEC stuff, right? But also, um, you know, I'm interested in permaculture, and I think you've seen around my house, oh, yeah, and yeah. like had a peach right there. I oh, just yeah. grew that no, peach. I, um, I remember last year. Yeah. Getting, getting a peach or two. <laughs> yeah, and so um. So I'm 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 interested in in any way to empower, um, or help support these groups that represent the empowerment of of the people where I visit. Sure.
I tell people that thermal storage, we have a lifetime of five to ten years. Because right? if you look at the cost of solar panels, the exponential mm -hmm. decrease, um, batteries are almost as fast in their decrease in cost. And we have first the computer industry, then the cell phone industry, then the automobile industry to thank for that, right? That, that, that all of this research is yep. going. And, um, and so Robert Van Buskirk, this guy I mentioned in Malawi, he's also producing these forever batteries that he's using lithium titanate, and they have a 10-year lifespan. They're more expensive than basic lithium. Yep. But all of this is going to come down. And so I would say in 10 years, people are not going to be... You, you, you probably won't even have insulation. It won't be important because right. what you'll do is you'll just charge your battery because it'll be inexpensive. And it could be a big game changer for poverty because all of a sudden now you have people who live in sunny areas. They have the resources to energy. They have access to energy because the cost of solar panels and battery and all of that is, is going to be... Um, you know, pretty inexpensive. Sure. Well, and that's the that's the model for Ecoca and Sunspot PV and about four or five other groups, but those are the two that I interviewed and uh, put the, the guts of an induction cooker in its own box with extra USB ports. No, I saw that, yeah. 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 They were also funded by Max, I believe. Yes, but uh, when that, where that appeals to me is, I think in terms of uh, being dependent on the grid and here you can give someone something. It's what, what would you call it? A nano grid or a pico grid? You know, it's just, it's not even a home you know, system. A house, yeah, a home, home system. Energy, yeah, a home solar yeah. system. Yeah, I'm just thinking of a term where you could express it to people and say, "This is independence." So if you mm -hmm. call it, you yeah, know, it's a power a pico is, grid so. or a personal grid or something, <laughs> so they can identify it with electricity. Mm -hmm. I don't know. All right. So our um, our heater is now down to 158 Celsius. So what you're seeing now, right, I mean, this is the problem with this, and that is, you know, the, the user cookpot interface, right, is who wants to have to pull their thing out like this. And so, I mean, that's something that, you know, is going to be the next round of design. Yeah. Andrew Shepard. I've uh, been working with Pete for about a year on uh, insulated solar electric cookers. Um, right now I'm working on these uh, positive thermal coefficients for a cooker, or they're called PTCs. See they're just like these small aluminum, small aluminum heaters. Sure. Uh, they're supposed to switch off at 220 degrees Celsius, but I have recorded them going up to 260. They heat up very quickly, and uh, for one kilogram of water, over 30 minutes, it's heated up uh, approximately 30 degrees, which is about 92 degree, uh, temperature change of 92 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, do you have any questions? Yeah. This, so this does this fit into a, like an insulated container, like uh, the other this item? It will. Uh, yeah. This one is. Um, I'm helping some new students understand how we are doing things. Uh, we are work this will be the first time we're actually making an ISAC with a with the PTCs. But I'm more or less just kind of guiding them through the whole assembly process. Sure. And they're attached to the pot how? That's is that some kind of a epoxy or some kind of This is uh, I believe it's RTV glue. Yeah, it, it acts like um, some thermal paste that you would normally find uh, on a CPU or something like that for okay. your computer that helps uh, spread the heat or makes it, uh, it it connects the heat a lot better than if you just set it on top of the pot. Okay, and this would be direct current for like a solar panel or batteries in between or what? Uh, for now, this is just going to be a direct. It is possible that 
we could try to use these in phase change material, but uh, since this is still a fairly new uh, design choice, we are just focusing on direct right now. Okay. And have you done any cooking with it yet? No, I'm still in the, uh, the testing period for my uh, senior project. Okay. Um, yeah, I can't think of any other questions. Well, why don't you show them a couple of yeah. the ISICs, like where is that going to go? Yeah. Like maybe you could, you could take them over that one right there and I'll bring it over. Yeah. So the students I have been working with, mm -hmm. uh, they are using this for the insulation, which is made up of uh, perlite and fiberglass. It's not finished as of yet. We still need to cover up the fiberglass as well as the perlite. Uh, but because of the size of the pot, a larger version, rather than a small bucket that we use for our... One of these small buckets that we have been using for our stainless steel pots. Sure. Uh, the size of this pot requires that we have a larger, we have a larger uh, insulation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And ultimately, is that going to go to Fatu? I believe so. Uh, that is the plan. Yeah. So that's interesting because this is this is a person who we've only met this week. Um, so Salma, the guy in Togo. Mm -hmm. So um, this ultimately will probably go to Fatu, who lives in Indiana, right? So Salma, who's in Togo, has said, "Hey, I, I want to introduce you to these people in Liberia." And they represent a company called Afrique Energy, right? And um, yeah, they're interested in all things energy related. And she is in the United States for an indeterminate amount of time. And so when I found that out, I was like, wow, she's got to come to Virginia. So she's going to come down to one of these shops. And so this is just kind of an illustration of how this world has now taken off on its own, right? Like it's just, it's just happening, I let go of the strings. And probably, um, and so she's expressed um, an enthusiastic interest in getting a few of these, right? And I don't think she's gonna make them, right? But uh, I told her, I said, you know, we've got our own sad history of sending these away to people and they never get hot because the people don't start cooking. And she's like, no, that's not gonna be me, right? So. Um, so very likely she'll get a bunch of our technologies. Like we'll send her this, and if she uses it, then maybe we'll send her another one. Sure, you know. Yeah, and you've you've actually heard from people too that are willing to possibly uh, reproduce them, manufacture them. No, they are manufacturing. Them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and then this is where they're going to be trying to sell, deploy, rent, lease. Yeah. So. Um, I'd be glad to share my final report with you, sure. right? I've, I've written it once and sent it to our funders, and they said, "No, it's not good enough." And they said, okay. you, "You got you got to add all this all this sure. uh, extra extra material." And you know, and then blah, 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 and then you start adding, and you're like, "Whoa! Like this was a really good idea. Like this was really <laughs> important." So I can tell you, um, we've built about just shy of 300 ISECs, oh, wow. right? And I'd say like a hundred of them were at Cal Poly, like you know, student groups just building sure. them and tossing them out, but. Um, you know, a good 150 of them have been built in Africa. And then I don't even count the ones that Robert Van Buskirk has built. I don't know how many he has, but it's, sure. it's probably on the order close to 100. Yeah. Yeah, so, so they're being built. It's yeah. not that people are saying I'm willing to build them. They're, yeah. you know, and, and, and we're learning from them, right? Yeah. So perlite is not something I would have thought of. But um, the reason we do it is because if we have fiberglass on the bottom, it'll compress and perlite won't compress. So we have, we have here, we have uh, fiberglass insulation around the side and the perlite on the bottom. Well, all I know of perlite, I think I'm right, is gardening yeah. stuff. It, what, yeah. is it, what is it composed of? It's, um, it's a volcanic ash. Oh, okay, sure, right? sure. And so you get it and you, uh, I, I'm not quite sure exactly how it works, but I think vermiculite is the same, which is also used in gardening, sure. right? Um, you heat it and it, it, it puffs up like popcorn somehow. And, uh, and then so you have this expanded ceramic, which has, I mean, the insulation capability is on the order of that of styrofoam, but it thermally robust is not even the term. I mean, this stuff okay. goes really hot. I was about to right? say, yeah, uh, it's, styrofoam, forget it. Yeah, I mean, right. yeah. styrofoam won't work, but, but, but perlite <laughs> 
and and uh, vermiculite. I, I'm not sure of the numbers, but I imagine it's on the order of a thousand Celsius sure. before there's a there's a problem with them. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Do they? Do, I mean, you may not be familiar with it, but if you are, uh, do they have a, a like financing scheme so like families can acquire one? Uh, yeah. They. They have different ideas of what they want to do. I know Solomon's straight up selling them, yeah. and they're still a little bit expensive as he's figuring that out. I know Robert Van Buskirk, it's cheaper for them to buy a solar panel and cooker from him than it is to buy a solar panel alone from on the local market. And so he's like, people come like, we want a solar panel. He goes, I can't do it, man. You can only buy a solar panel and a cooker. And if you use the cooker, and I can test it because I, I you know, it records your sure. use. If you use the cooker, then I'll let you buy another solar panel. Or I'll let you buy a bigger solar panel. So, so he has a very, I mean, he has certainly has the most interesting business model. Sure, Robert Van Buskirk, and he's in Malawi. Yeah. I should show you this while we got it. So this is our plan. Is one of the problems we ran into is um, the the longevity of um, of the parts, right? So when we did erythritol which melts at 120 Celsius, but we took it up to 180 Celsius as a liquid. We found that ultimately it, it degraded, but in the process we also had problems with the wires falling apart or it dissolving the uh, silicone around the silicone wires. Sure. And so we said, look, if we're gonna go up to 300 or 350 Celsius, right, so 600 Fahrenheit, um, we're worried about the materials. And so we, we, got, we got these, these immersion, immersion heaters and. I don't know how much we paid for this. I know that if you have a new one made in the United States, for one, it's 500 bucks. But, but if you buy a thousand of them uh, from China, they're you know two dollars each or whatever. So we got we got um, we got these, and we're going to adhere it to here, and then it sits in. And you you can see this one right here. Oh this sure. Is, this one is full of uh, erythritol, I believe. And so it sits in here, and in between is where the um, the salt will go, mm -hmm. right? And that way, we don't have to worry about any connections. There's no soldering, or you can't solder anyway because the solder melts at that, you know, the, those temperatures. And the beauty of this, uh, again, I never would have realized it if I wasn't using it myself. And I like to say this was a brilliant idea on my part, but it was really just dumb luck. Is that? By, by adhering the heating element to the inner pot, right? I explained to you how we can engage or disengage the thermal storage because sometimes you don't want the thermal storage to be used, right? This does it automatically because the salt is an insulator. But when it, when it uh, melts, it, it convects and, and carries heat very effectively, right? So in the morning, if this is cold, it's all solid. The current comes in and it heats this area up, but the heat does not get conducted into the thermal storage. So you can cook your food, and all the heat goes just to the food. Right. right? And then you clean out the food, and this gets hotter and hotter and melts and begins convecting. Um, it's important that, that you have um, the salt up to this level because then it can convect up and around. Otherwise, it'll make a thermal climb. And so, yeah. So without having to throw any switches or make any decisions, automatically the hottest part is where you cook. And until it gets hot enough to cook food, none of the heat actually, or very little of the heat is actually conducted into the thermal storage. But so over time, the heating element could be turned off and then the, the heat from the salts will be the, doing the cooking. Well, I mean, I, I, like, Probably, I mean, in my house, the heating element will never be turned off, right? Right. But at night, you know, you come back and you throw the food in, and it's still hot, right? Yes. Because you've you've got, you know, so I mean, that's, it's kind of like, um, when we did it with erythritol, it just worked really well, and I described it as kind of like a, a thermal microwave oven, right? It's just it's a place in your kitchen that's always hotter than hell. You just throw the sure. food in, and it cooks, and it cooks pretty quick, like. Yep. Neil and I cooked a Cornish hen. Um, it said you were supposed to put it in a, an oven, a 350 degree oven for an hour. And um, we put a thermocouple on the inside and partially due to this heat pipe effect that I described to you, it, it was over 70 Celsius 
inside the chicken after seven minutes. And we, we cooked it, I think, for, for 15 minutes? Yeah, we cooked it for 15 minutes. It was very thoroughly cooked. Sure, sure. Yeah. Great. So this will be just much more effective at that higher temperature, we think. Right, but until, until you know, the proof of the yep. Cornish hen is in the cooking, right? Yes. yes. Yeah, so until we cook with it, we don't, we don't really know. Yeah. So scattered throughout the lab, there's past projects that are... Everywhere you look. Expensive. Yes. Right, like, <laughs> so you look here, and we've got, um, we're insulating with uh, rock wool, right, which is kind of like fiberglass, but it's made from... Um, sure. Slag runoff from making steel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we have this one. This is from Martin, right? This is an erythritol straight from Martin? No, that's not from Martin. Oh, uh, this is the xylitol. This is xylitol from Elsa. And yeah, this is the, uh, the sun bucket that we were trying to turn into a sun bucket ISEC, but we may or may not because because that's what this is going to be sure. all about. Um, what's going on? Uh, you know, a lot of failures, a lot of failures that were yeah. really important to have. This again, this is this is just your aluminum sun bucket, right? That, mm -hmm. There you got it, right? Just one big chunk of aluminum. That's like solid. That's whole yeah. aluminum. And this is, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm very sure this was Michael Fernandez's senior project, right? He put he put two thermocouples here to measure the difference in temperature. And, and, and of course, aluminum is such a good conductor. The difference in it's temperature like between these two, I think, never went more than a degree, you oh. know, as, as, as you pulled the heat out of it. Um, Here. Oh, that's my experiment for testing the PCs. Oh, so this, this is not a cooker. This is just for testing. This is just, you just have that there because you needed some good insulation. Yes. All right. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Yeah, and our power sources, because we don't, we don't always, um, we don't always use solar panels, right, if we wanted to experiment at night. Um, we tested a whole bunch of PTCs to see what the degree of reproducibility is. This is an interesting one where we used um, a double wall stainless steel vacuum chamber for a vacuum vessel for the insulation. And what we found is it don't work that well. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually, the insulation was not what it could have been. And um, I mean, this is a, a, uh, a popular, readily available, inexpensive one. I think this is like 30 bucks, 40 bucks. I bought one that was considerably more expensive and it did work better. Uh, what else do we got here to show off? Yeah, you might take a picture of that. Bring that over, Neil. That, that's, that's, an, that's an example of what's in my kitchen. Oh, sure. Right. Okay, so that's what's in the in yeah. The, that's the the heating you know the heating platform. Sure. I, I think the one I have yeah, is a picture. little bit different yeah. because let's see if we look at this. Yeah, this is a failure, right? Because the heating element came up over the edge, and what's really important, as I said, is you have to have really good um, thermal connection. So it's got to be really really smooth and really flat. So this would work, but you'd have to put. Pot right here. You sure. Well, now, is that that's not nic Is that the nichrome, or is that a different? Yeah. So this element? this is just a heating element from your um, where is that from from your oven, right? Oh, sure. Okay, just a regular. Yeah. So I, so the, the nichrome wire is on the inside, right? Right. And if you go to our construction manual, they'll describe how you you do it. You figure out how much resistance you want, and mm -hmm. for a um, a twelve volt 100 watt solar panel, which actually has its maximum power point at about 18 volts with six amps. Mm -hmm. So you want three ohms for a resistor. And so you have to figure out how long you want it to be. Okay. And the outside, we think the outside is aluminum. This is very flexible stuff, right? You can bend it quite easily. And that's actually the heating element you get in a regular electric stove range? This is, this, this is, this is from an oven. Right, okay. No, not pretty much like it. This is, that is from oven, yeah. Amazon.com. Yeah. Yeah. Heating element for another. Well, yeah. and because I was just thinking it was one solid piece of metal. No, but it's not. No, 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 no. Okay. It's heat because yeah. um, because you don't want to electrocute yourself. Right. You, so you, you've got you, you've got some metal housing, and then the nichrome wire is kind of twisted down the middle. Yep. It, you can look it up. There's some videos oh, about sure. how they make this, and yeah. it's, it's actually pretty intense. The white stuff is magnesium oxide, which is. It has an interesting property of being thermally conductive but electrically non-conductive. 
right? Because okay. you, you, you know you don't want to short, oh, of course. But, but you yeah. want the heat to come off of the wire, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, and then so, they got to have that wrap perfectly, or if the nit the nichrome hits the the metal yeah, on the outside, no, then you, you're you're you, done. You, yeah, <laughs> you, you can't have that, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you wouldn't be dead. Probably you just short out your. Yeah. There'd be problems. Yes. Right, and so I mean that's the same thing as in here. Yep. Right, but this is stainless steel. Yeah. So it's harder to bend. Um, and so for a while, for the the erythritol isex, we and you can see that that's what this is. This is just this is a chunk of a heating element from from a stove mm -hmm. from a stove top. And um, you know, so we would make our heating elements like this, and you'd crimp the wires. And it's just it's really difficult when this temperature goes over 200 Celsius, which is the melting point of solder. You have to do a whole bunch of things different. Like what kind of glue can you, and then. You have to immerse it in, in a conductive liquid because the, the, the sugar alcohol is somewhat conductive. Sure. Uh, the liquid salt is very conductive. So there's all kinds of challenges if we want to make our own, which is why, at least for now, sure. we're just buying immersion heaters. Yes. Yeah. Here we go. There's an Occam's razor. Simplest solution is usually the correct one. <laughs> Isn't that Occam? I don't, I don't, I mean. It's so the philosophy where he says the if you've got a choice amongst solutions to a problem, the simplest one is usually the correct one. Ah, all right. <laughs> well, well, I mean, the, the, the advice I heard from, from Sal Brunner, a professor at Princeton, was a physicist can't make anything, right? And it's true, most things were invented by physicists. Sure. But you should never make something that you can buy, right? Because your creative energy should go right. to exploring things that don't exist yet, sure. right? And when someone produces something industrially, right, there's a huge amount of quality control and reproducibility and safety that they dealt with that, I mean, that's not what we want to spend our time with, right? So really, I did this backwards by making the first heaters where what we really should do is just buy a heater. And if this winds up working in concept, then we can go and open up all those other doors. Like, how could we get these cheaper? Should we mass produce them? Should we just buy them? Should we make them by a different means? Right? Yes. Yeah. No, that's great because that's the that's part of the, the creative process all, mm -hmm. all, all together in one. Way. Right, and can you buy these in um, Nairobi? Right, right, and so it, it turns out that these are not readily available in uh, Cameroon, but they can buy them in Ghana. Okay. So are they going to make them? Are they going to like the the guy in Cameroon, um, Bijang in Cameroon, just? imported a spool of nichrome wire and he makes his own cooker, his own heaters, the way uh, Alexis Ziegler at Living Energy Farm does is he, he pours a tiny little patty of concrete and then just lays a nichrome wire down on top of it and it's a radiant heater. Uh, Craig Berglund in Reno, nichrome wire under a couple of bathroom tiles, just winds its way under it and just basically rests them on there and then heats them up to be the heat sink, the storage in the sun oven. Yeah. 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 yeah and, there you go. And it, he says it adds 100 degrees or more Fahrenheit uh, to whatever he's cooking. <laughs> yeah. Great. And, you can, and you can get it started before the sun clears his house and <laughs> it's cooker. Yeah. I see. All right. Well, okay. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release you to the road. Yes. All right. Thanks for coming. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much.